Prevo.ntas. So today we will kind of conclude our, you know, kind of journey, our intro to looking at machine learning from a robustness perspective. And in the first lecture, as you remember, we kind of, you know, introduced one of the, not the only, but definitely one of the most prominent uh, examples of like, or, you know, evidence of how brittle our machine learning world is, namely the adversarial examples. But also we outlined an approach to get, you know, to train machine learning classifiers that are actually robust uh, to this kind of perturbations, at least as long as this perturbation belong to certain relatively simplistic but well-defined class. Okay, and essentially like all we were saying needs to happen there is essentially to just train the model in this like, you know, using this adversarially robust training, namely when we just don't uh, just update the, the parameters of our models according to the training data directly, but instead we actually have this additional step of trying to find always the most confusing perturbation of these training points, you know, before we actually update our model based on that. Okay, and we, as we discussed, you know, this actually tends to work. And also last time we kind of started to think about, okay, so what are the foundations of this field? So, okay, so we know what is the problem. We kind of know at least what is, you know, some approach that seems to start to succeed, but now it's a good time to ask, okay, so, but like what's going on? Why these things happen? You know, why this is hard? And that's what uh, the last lecture was about. So in particular, we talked about why learning robust classifiers may be hard, like what may be the fundamental reasons for that? And essentially, well, we know that training classifiers is more complex because we need to solve this min max problem. We also know that kind of there is this trade off that essentially more uh, like by essentially getting robust models, you might not necessarily get the best of two worlds. So essentially you might need to sacrifice standard accuracy to actually get good, uh, uh, well, uh, robust accuracy. And finally, uh, also uh, we noticed that to get a robust generalization, that's also something that we touched on in the exercise yesterday is that kind of you might for to get robust generalization, you might need to use more training data than what you need for standard generalization, okay? So these are some of the principles that tell us how standard learning differs from adversarial robust learning. And then also we, we started to talk about, okay, but like, why is this lack of brittle, like a lack of uh, robustness such a widespread problem? And kind of we kind of motivated uh, this, uh, what we call like robust features models, kind of this realization that if we think about like all the features in our data that we could use for classification. And there are like some, you know, useful, like useless direction that the model might be, you know, uh, might be uh, sensitive to that, like they do not really uh, provide any real information about the label, but maybe the model just uh, kind of is sensitive for them for like some random reasons. Then there are kind of this robust features. So features that are actually, actually correlated with the label. So they have the right information and they retain this information, this correlation, even when perturbed in an imperceptible manner. And in particular, everything that we as humans use in our, in our perception and classification falls into this category. But then we also realize that there are these so-called non-robust features, like features that actually are correlated with the label also, but tend to be very brittle. Kind of, they can be easily flipped via perturbations that are imperceptible to us. And kind of what's happening is that our model, they just care about maximizing test accuracy. So any features that are useful are good and non-robust features are actually often great to get the information about the label. So kind of this is why, you know, our models tend to pick on them and that's how they become vulnerable to such adversarial perturbation. That's why this is such a widespread phenomenon. Okay, so that's roughly where we stop, where we kind of finished last time. So now, well, what now? So we have this realization. So what does it give us? And you know, as usual, whenever you kind of start understanding foundation of some phenomena, this kind of in, like this kind of helps you in many many ways. In particular, you get the new perspective on adversarial robustness. Like, and if you start to have a different way how to think about this problem, that might be quite different to how we started thinking about this problem. And it, as we will see, it also provides insights into other questions too. Okay. So, so first of all, like there is like once we know that there is kind of just, that this is all about this robust and non-robust features, kind of there is a new, uh, very amusing capability that emerges here. Essentially, what we are able to do is we want we are able to robustify not models but actually data sets. So you can take a you know some training set you know in which like there are frogs, I don't know, horses and some other uh, animals, and you can create a 
robustified version of that data set, which, you know, here is a look example, and I will, I can explain in, in you know, uh, later on, you know, like there, are, there is interest, you know, uh, how this, you know, how this uh, kind of uh, data is created. But essentially the point is that this data set kind of, uh, like the only features that exist in the data set, like the only features correlated with the label that exist in the data sets are the robust one, are, are the other robust ones. So as a result, the kind of the, the funny thing there is that no matter, like we don't anymore need to train a model in a robust manner. Essentially, whenever we train a model uh, in a standard manner, like no, no matter how we learn from this, uh, from this training set, uh, our model will, will always remain uh, like, you know, robust. Okay, so in some ways there is no longer this problem that like, oh, if we train in standard manner, we will get some good accuracy, but you know, the our accuracy might be not robust. And if you train robustly, then yeah, you are robust, but maybe you don't get the, the best accuracy here. Here kind of all ways of learning are good because the only features you can learn from are robust. So you know the model will be automatically robust, you know, whenever it just is able to learn some. Okay. Great. So so this is a specification. And you know, it really shows that it's only about the features. So we don't do any more anything with the training. We just kind of control what features are there in the data. And in some ways, you know, as you remember, I told you that there's kind of some approaches that claim that the reason why our models are brittle is because yeah, we train with patch norm, we use ResNets, we because of over parameterization. And what this robustified uh, data set shows us is that this is not true. Like kind of this cannot be like no particular training technique can be solely responsible for vulnerability because you know on this data set it doesn't matter what you use for training and you actually are getting robust so it's really like is about features and not you know not about models of course like the training technique has impact on how robust the model is and you know that's why robust training works versus not standard training but it's not just like the only reason why there are the, the, there are problems okay so this is one thing the other kind of interesting perspective is on transferability so remember uh, kind of, you know, uh, I uh, told you that like what is very remarkable about visceral perturbations uh, is that they uh, they tend to like transfer between uh, different models. So I, you know, find the perturbation that fools a particular model, but I can apply it to uh, other, like to other model, like you know, the input of the other model, and it tends to work pretty well. Okay. And now you might wonder why this is kind of actually quite unusual because the model can have very different architecture uh, and and so on and so on. And you know, I say like why there is so much similarity in terms of vulnerability and now we kind of understand. So essentially we know that adversarial perturbations usually they correspond to altering these non-robust features in the data. But you know, features are a property of the data set. You know, models just need to be able to capture them. So essentially if you have different models, uh, kind of essentially if you have different models, like if there are non-robust non -robust features that are useful in the data set, many models will use them no matter how they work exactly. And essentially like, well, if the models tend to rely on the same features, then if you perturb them, well, the same perturbation will work for many models as well. And it finally kind of explains this mystery. And in particular, here is just like one example where essentially you can show that, you know, kind of, you know, uh, different models that were trained on the data set that kind of where the classification has to rely on features that are non-robust to specific architecture, to the ResNet 50 architecture. And essentially what you see is that, you know, the, the better the models are at kind of learning using these non-robust features of the ResNet, uh, 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 like identified using the ResNet 50 architecture, the better the perturbation trust. Okay, so there really is this kind of connection that like it's all the way the transferability is mainly uh, supported is via relying on the same non-robust features. Okay, so there is a question in the chat. So. Uh, the, uh, but the accuracy of this robustified data set, set will be lower than the accuracy of the no, no, uh, on non-robust one. Yes, yes, yes. That's of course, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of goes back to what we discussed before. Yes. So yeah, the good thing about this robustified data set is that whatever you learn there, you learn robustly, but the price you pay, like sort of you pay the, 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 the price of admission, like in this process of robustifying data set, we essentially erase non-robust features from it. So then at this point, kind of the, you know, the ability of the models to learn from it get diminished. So yeah, so the accuracy you'll be getting will be generally lower than the one that you can get from the original data set, if, especially if you learn in a standard manner. Okay, that, that was a great question. Okay, so this is about the transferability, but now, but now you can also go back to the robust training that we talked about, the very robust training that we talked about. 
And kind of even now when we understand that this is about you know about uh, robust versus non-robust features, things start to make sense. So remember, like when you we do standard training, standard ERM training, then we kind of maximize like minimize this expectation, empirical expectation of the loss. Okay. Now, when you do this robust ERM, so this adversarial training, what we do, we are trying to minimize this expectation of the maximum over the examples. And again, there is some intuition why this is the right thing to do in terms of, you know, in terms of training. But honestly, like again, there is no good intuition why this also helps us generalize into robust manner. But now, kind of with this new perspective, it's kind of clear what's going on. Essentially, when you train your model via this robust ERM, what you are really telling the model is that, you know, whatever you use for classification, it should be insensitive to any features that can be flipped using this perturbation. So essentially, it's not only that I tell my model, oh, your prediction should be flat around these particular points. What we really are conveying to the model is that whatever is your decision, like the way you make decisions, it should not involve features that are non-robust with respect to, you know, with, with respect to a given perturbation class. So in some ways, you, what you are really communicating to the model is that this, you know, from the point of view of the model, these features are use, useless because, you know, each time you rely on them, you know, you will get fooled during training. So again, so I, you will always get penalized whenever you try to rely on any of the non-robust features, okay? And since now you are regularizing the features that the model learns, not just behavior around particular examples, this is what is the driver of the, of the robust generalization because you know, it stops relying on the robust features, on the non-robust features, so it is robust uh, because of that. I have, okay? Can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, if you re will replace max by expectation, this would, uh, I, I presume, correspond somehow to data augmentation, right? Yes, so essentially, like, yes. Yeah. So the augmentation would be if you kind of did, yeah, if this was a random perturbation, like a random perturbation from the set. And, uh, and, and it wouldn't work. It no. doesn't work, right? Okay, so yeah, what's, yeah, yeah. Uh, So, okay, that was my question, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the reason why kind of like from optimization point of view, why expectation here doesn't work is that there is just many directions you could take. And if you just take uh, random ones, you will actually never discover the sensitivity of the model to a particular non-robust feature. So essentially, like in some ways, what you are looking for here is finding this non-robust features that actually model pays attention to. And again, finding it at random is essentially impossible. This is a high dimensional distribution. You really need to have this optimization process that drives you towards the right direction. Okay, great. So this is about the role of robust training, but actually, again, I didn't tell you really about this, but the kind of, there is also like recently, the, there is like an emerging a different way of getting robust models. At least like it's a way that works for a very particular type of perturbation, but like whenever it works, it actually works very well. It's called randomized smoothing. And very roughly, I don't want to go into it too much, is that like the way you train your model is you actually use standard ERM training, but you train the model on inputs with a large noise from, from this perturbation. So essentially like you just kind of train the model by like very noisy, like by noisy meaning adding a random, not a max, but random perturbation, uh, uh, you know, to your thing. So this is exactly what Shimon asked about, like kind of, so you are in this regime, but the trick there is that, uh, you know, essentially, okay, so, so I didn't, didn't, didn't write it here, but and the way that you do prediction is essentially you kind of you, whenever I give you an input, you also, you know, you give me, you know, uh, like I actually generate a bunch of noisy version of this input. Like I also add random perturbations to it. And then I take a majority vote of the prediction of my model over this, you know, over the directions. And kind of this method makes sense because, you know, in some ways you can, you know, this added large noise, again, you are adding a lot of noise, much more than the robustness you actually want to be robust to. And in some ways it overwhelms the signal that, you know, uh, that essentially you could get from non-robust features because you are kind of making them so noisy that, you know, they, they, uh, they, like, they lose the correlation with the label. And that's again, why you are pushing away the model from, you know, uh, from being, you know, from being useful for the, uh, for the model and, and from using this non-robust feature. So kind of in the end, the effect is exactly the same, although all of the mechanism is very different. And again, there's a lot of details here that kind of make this method, like the good thing about this method is that this is very fast, but the problem is that, you know, kind of it's like, you know, uh, it doesn't work for all perturbations out of the box, you know, or at least, you know, you need to a lot of uh, noise to make it work, but like the more noise you increase, your standard accuracy goes down. It's because you are now asking model to classify quite noisy inputs, okay? 
Great. And you know, overall, and I think some of you already realized this, in particular, the question today already uh, pinpointed that is the kind of this also shows that there is this kind of inherent kind of connection of between like or trade off between robustness and data efficiency. Okay, so robust models can only leverage robust features. So you know, even though there are non robust features that do help with standard generalization. So again, from this point of view, there is no surprise that you need more data to achieve a given accuracy, because again, your efficiency of learning from data is, goes lower because you kind of constrain the model only to learn in a certain way. And similarly, you will in general, you know, might be getting lower standard accuracy because again, you are crippling your model by just saying, okay, there are you know, things that tell you about the, you know, about, about the correct label, but you are not allowed to use it because they are not robust features. Okay, and kind of, and you might say again, this is a big, you know, the, uh, like this is the big argument against using robustness because okay, it's clearly like you are constraining your model and kind of it doesn't get great standard accuracy. But I guess the question I want to you to like I want to leave you with here is just okay. So well, if your model, the reason why your model is performing well is before because it's, it like leverages non-robust features, is it is it actually something you desire? Like again, it might be that there are non-robust features that are actually like some interesting insights into the structure of the problem, okay? And then of course, the ability of the models to identify them and use them is very useful. But like in vision, like if the reason why you think a cat is a cat kind of is something that, well, clearly you as a human will not use because these are non-robust features, then you should be concerned that like this should not be say oh that's great you know like anything helps it's kind of you might say okay so clearly the model might be thinking that it's solving the task i wanted to solve but maybe it is solving some different task okay? kind of even though again uh, like this different types uh, task tends to coincide with what counts as performance in the benchmark i care about okay so that's just something uh, to think about and we will come back to this question later on I just want to, uh, to highlight that there is a, like, we found that there is like a simple, nice uh, uh, theoretical setting, just if someone wants to kind of have a bit more rigorous kind of way of building the intuitions. And this kind of corresponds to max likelihood Gaussian classification. So roughly the setup is just the following. Imagine you have just two classes, which like the distribution, the distribution corresponds to the two classes and there are like two Gaussians. Uh, you know, and again, the setting is exactly the same as in the exercises today. So essentially, there's just like, you know, there are two Gaussians with the mean, like, you know, one is centered around the mean and the other is centered around minus that mean. And now let's assume we are in the infinite sample regime. So essentially, so this is not what we analyze in the, in the exercise. We just assume you have infinite number of samples. So in particular, you know what, you know, what the mean and the variance is. And essentially what you want to come up with is just you want to come up with a classifier that if I give you a new sample from the distribution, so I don't tell you if this is from, like let's say probability one half, it's from the blue distribution, probability one half is, is, is from the red distribution. And they just give you a sample. And your goal is to figure out what is the most likely like class that the sample uh, belongs to, meaning, you know, subject to being uh, gen generated by this data. Okay, so kind of standardly, like the way you work is just you find the so-called max likelihood parameters. So actually you figure out kind of, you know, essentially based of samples, like kind of what the, you know, essentially again, so, so here we like an infinite data regime, like you can assume that things are known, but essentially like the question is like, what would be the, your max, uh, uh, like essentially what would be your empirical, like if I give you the samples and kind of, you know, like the way, like the way you would solve this problem, there was not infinite number of samples. You would try to figure out the empirical uh, mean and the empirical variance. And of course, you know, uh, in the infinite data regime, this would just become the correct uh, mean and correct variance. And the way you would do the classification, well, you would do it by just, you know, like the likelihood test. So if you do all the math, essentially once you know exactly what the mu star and sigma star is, then essentially this would be the classifier that is the optimal one. That kind of, kind of essentially divides the region into the things that were the samples in this region are more likely to come from the red Gaussian versus the region of the space where the samples are more likely to come from the blue Gaussian, okay? So that's kind of the very standard, very simple max likelihood Gaussian classification. But now the question is, what happens if you want to do it in a L2, let's say robust way, okay? So what I mean by L2 robust way is that like, you want to now figure out a max likelihood parameters of the distribution, essentially, but in a situation where you think that the samples, so maybe you have infinite data as well, but the samples that you are seeing might have been perturbed by the adversary. 
in some kind of, you know, in some, in some way. And kind of you want to come up with like, what is your best guess for, you know, what the actual mean and the actual uh, variance was. Okay, so essentially like whenever you have a point, you know, like, well, you know, you may be the X is here, but like in reality, it might have came from anywhere in this ball, L2 ball around this point, And you don't know, don't know from where exactly, because again, the point was adversarially perturbed. And now, you know, kind of you would like to just like, you would like to estimate essentially this mean and variance. So like, you know, following the standard, you know, uh, maximum like you know, the classification rule, uh, according to this estimated mean and uh, variance, actually you know, like, you know, again, it solves the task you want to solve. In some ways, like even despite this adversary, you would like to be able to do as well as possible in terms of figuring out, you know, where from which class this particular sample you see might be coming from. And of course, the question is now, okay, so when, now so once you have this in interference of the adversary, like what should be your best estimates for the mean and for the, for the variance? And in particular, notice that like, essentially if this, you know, if this Gaussians are too squ squished, squished, essentially like when kind of this, you know, uh, this kind of this corresponding, you know, uh, variance is kind of different from identity variance when, when this Gaussians would be just balls. And kind of there's something weird happening because like when I move a little bit in this direction, uh, kind of it actually is quite a lot of movement from the point of view of data. In some ways kind of uh, like, you know, if you think about uh, like, like about moving this direction, then again, from the adversary point of view, they can like move equally well from, you know, in the horizontal uh, direction and in the, uh, and in the vertical directions, uh, but kind of from the point of view of data, like moving this direction, has much bigger consequences in terms of likelihood, you know, a, a, a likelihood of coming from a data set that moving in this direction. And essentially now there will be a distortion that, co uh, that comes out of this. And essentially long story short, what happens is that if you think about what are the best estimates of the mean and the variance, well, the answer is that the variance, uh, sorry, the, the mean st stays the same, that you still kind of in the end want to recover new star, but kind of your best, uh, you know, your best variance is essentially a blend of the actual variance of the Gaussian and the identity matrix, because essentially you want to kind of correct for this, uh, you know, for this ability of the adversary to kind of move also in the directions that are quite far in your, you know, kind of uh, from the point of view of your, you know, of your uh, Gaussian measure. Okay, so just empirically, like if I look at what is my, you know, uh, best classifier for the standard uh, setting when uh, there is no adversary. And you now see about like at what are your estimates of the Gaussians as you kind of the amount of noise you want, adversarial noise you want to tolerate grows. We see that kind of, you know, again, here they are like very squashed because that's the kind of the true data, but essentially like as you are figuring out how to do it robustly, you essentially think of Gaussians that are more and more close to being a circles. Okay, and again, just comes from the fact that you want to be able to protect yourself by the adversary fooling you by just you know moving in this direction very easily, okay? Which again means a lot if you if these are your uh, like you know Gaussian likelihoods you are working with, but you don't want them to mean you know too much. So essentially that's why kind of you are trying to you know uh, like twist this classification you know this classification uh, you know region this way, okay? And there are also some interesting things to observe here. So essentially like what happens is again you can view this direction. As corresponding to a non-robust direction and robust features. And essentially what happens is that as you want to be more and more robust, your model depends less and less, like starts to ignore this direction more and more. And the other interesting thing is that like you can think about the gradient, like imagine you have a point over here and you say, what is the direction in which I should be moving to kind of to make this point be classified as the point of the other, like, you know, of the other class, like, where should I be going? What is the straightest direction to, to go there, which will be exactly the gradient of the loss. And you see that currently this gradient of the loss just like takes us somewhere, you know, somewhere kind of actually away. Like, well, it, 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 it's, it's going in direction of, you know, of the actual, you know, the other class, but not too far. But essentially as we get more and more robust and essentially these gradients align better with the actual data direction. And again, this actually is a simple model, but this kind of effects is something we also observe on real machine learning models, the kind of the gradient that we will, we will talk about it in a moment, the gradients actually align much better with, you know, data meaningful directions in the, you know, in the, in the space. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, so this is just like, you know, a, 
a little bit of, of like, you know, uh, glimpse of like some interesting, you know, a setting, factual setting when you can, you know, prove everything and it kind of captures some of the key properties of the model. And, but now what I want to talk about is kind of, kind of go back to the realization that we already had is that you can view kind of robust training and this, you know, insist on robustness as a, some form of regularization. In particular, you want to say, okay, it's good that the robust models are robust, but actually like if I forget about trying to look at robustness of the models, like what other properties robust models have that standard models might not have, okay? In particular, you know, what, like, what really happens to the model when we force it to rely on these robust features? And what happens is essentially, and this is you know, uh, kind of one of the key phenomena that, that we observe, is that essentially this robustness uh, regularization uh, you know, leads to kind of making this, especially the, the vision models, be more perceptually aligned. Okay, so here is like uh, one example. So essentially like, you know, people try to figure out, you know, like for a given image, you know, why did the model, you know, make decisions on this image the way it did? So why did it decide that this image should be a, you know, labeled as a dog? And one very simple way to do it is just looking at the pixel influences, heat maps, okay? So, or, or silence maps. So essentially what you do is just for every, for every pixel, you ask how much changing this pixel alone would influence the decision to classify this dog as a dog. And if you do it and you kind of, you know, and you color this pixel proportionally to, to, to the influence, you will get like kind of, uh, you know, uh, maps like here. So you see, so clearly it kind of, it focuses on the, some of the parts of the image that are relevant, but also it kind of depends on stuff that is a bit less relevant, okay? But like, that's what you get. However, if you do the same uh, exercise, but to a robust model, and again, the robust here just means you are robust to the L2 pixel-wise perturbations. Then you are getting, you know, influence uh, heat maps like that, which kind of are much, much, much closer aligned to what kind of you would expect if you, as a human, were asked to kind of paint the pixels accordingly. Okay. And in general, like essentially, what we notice is that, like, if you look at uh, this neural, like, ro robust neural networks. So essentially, remember that neural networks in general they have this layer structure. In particular, there is this like last representation structure, kind of like this is this like second to last layer that is called the representation layer that you can view of like reparameterization of the original data into some nice kind of in, in some nice way. So what we notice is that essentially for standard models, kind of you can think of this as a fingerprint of data of like, so I input an image here and it's kind of compute something in the end, you can get like some fingerprint of this image. And what happens is that you can easily find you know, two images that are completely different, but their fingerprints are very close. So the representations are very close together, okay? So this shows that there are kind of some things that are very different to humans that the model confuses as being essentially the same thing. However, when you do it for robust models, kind of we try hard to, to kind of uncover this kind of distinct par pairs that kind of, you know, so things that are different to humans, but seem to be the same to the model. And we essentially are, were unable to find them. So it seems that kind of this, you know, notion of what is similar, uh, you know, from the point of view of the model seems to be much, much better aligned uh, with, you know, with what is similar to us humans. Okay, and again, this goes back to the fact that now the features that the model uses are much closer to the features that the human uses. Okay, and this is actually ends up, you know, being very useful because the, you can do a lot of cool things in a simple way with here. So you can kind of start doing, you know, feature visualization. You can look for different neurons and figure out what they are sensitive to, and then you discover that they actually can attribute to them some actual uh, meaning that you can understand as a human, like what this neuron corresponds to. For instance, like if you identify a neuron that identifies stripes, existence of stripes in the image, then you can do this kind of cool things when you kind of take an image and you just now ask the model, okay, uh, you know, change this image in a way that makes your stripe detector neuron be more excited, okay, essentially be activated more. And what you get is you get essentially like a way to put stripes on the, you know, on the animals, okay? By just like doing this kind of very simple primitive, you know, they can, you can also like do like semantic interpolation, uh, essentially like a, an easy way of like, you know, of, you know, of, of morphing, you know, one object into the other. And again, you do it in a via standard linear algebra. You just take two points, you look at the representation, uh, like the, 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 the straight line in a representation between them, essentially you kind of figure out, you know, how to follow this representation line, uh, you know, with your model and that's the images that you get. 
And also we discover, for instance, like things that like this robust representations then, then tend to transfer better across tasks. So essentially like if you train a robust model on a given data set, it tends to be more useful for, you know, for transferring uh, this model to different uh, data sets. So that's another reason why these robust representations are useful. Okay, and again, you know, once you have such a thing, you can do a lot of cool stuff. You can do generation. So you can kind of come up with like a way of like training this, you know, you train your model on some data set. And then essentially you figure out a simple way of kind of sampling from its representation of like what it means by a cliff, what it means by mashed potato, and you're getting images like that. They might not look super impressive out of the box, but like, you know, maybe three years ago, like essentially like two years before this work was out, this will be viewed as state of the art, like, you know, things advance quite a bit, you know, using gangs and kind of people figuring out how to make guns, ni guns nicer, but like they put a lot of engineering into it. Here, this is like just, you know, a few lines of, of a PyTorch code and you are just getting this. So, you know, you, you could put more work and get uh, something much better. You can do, yeah, again, this image translations, you can go do like super resolution, like essentially a lot of, you know, a lot of ways of like things that you can do now in computer vision using deep learning, it seems that it's much easier to do it once you do it with robust models, okay? And one, you know, particularly ni nice feature that kind of the robust models enable is something we called counterfactual analysis with robust models. And it's like, it's in quotes because it's not really counterfactual, but you will get, you know, like, you know, like, you, know you will get a sense why they use this name in a moment. So what, the, what is the idea? So you know, imagine I have this input over here and kind of this input is classified as a dog by my model, even though the correct classification is an insect, okay? And this is even true for robust model. Like robust model also thinks this is a dog, even though, you know, uh, the correct label is insect. And of course you might say, okay, well, my model got something wrong, you know, uh, big news, not the first time, not the, uh, uh, not the last time. But the interesting thing to ask is saying, okay, but like, why did it make this mistake? Like, is there a, a good reason for making this mistake? And essentially what you can do with robust models, you can essentially ask the model, okay, if you believe that this image is an image of, uh, you know, like an image of a dog, can you kind of morph this image for me to show me like what would make this, model, this image even more look like a dog to you, okay? And when you do this, essentially you get the, you know, the picture on the right. And if you look at the picture of the light in the top left corner, then clearly there is a dog there. So no surprise, this is a dog. But the surprising thing is that if you look back at the original image and you look at this top left corner and you squint your eyes, you realize that you do see dog's head in here. And this is a model trained on ImageNet and it has a lot of dogs in the training set. So essentially like whenever it is possible for this model to, you know, uh, uh, to uh, hallucinate a, a dog, it will, you know, it will hallucinate the dog because it just like, he really wants to see the dogs because he knows that there's a lot of dogs in the distribution it was trained. Okay, so in this same way, you can kind of introspect into why, uh, you know, uh, why the model got wrong. And the end, the question is, you know, does this mean that when the robust models are wrong, uh, they are usually more sensibly wrong? Well, definitely more sensibly. I wouldn't say that they're always sensibly wrong. Like I'm, I'm sure they are wrong in many other ways as well, but yes, indeed, it seems that uh, uh, like yeah, the way they kind of fail is a little bit, you know, like less egregious than standard models. And again, this goes back to this intuition of like, if they use the way they make decisions is closer to human perception, then again, also their mistakes will be closer to what human perception can uh, explain. But again, I'm not claiming here that all the, you know, all the uh, things that the robust model does, all the mistakes are actually reasonable. But yes, you know, th that's exactly the, the, the claim is that, you know, that it's definitely more sensitive. Okay, and kind of this are actually like, you know, uh, this is what kind of makes me view the robustness framework, not just a framework of making our models more robust to other sort of examples, but really as a way to like have a framework for controlling like what correlations, you know, kind of what features our models rely on. Okay, so again, so of course, it, this is clear implications for other sort of examples, but like, you know, even if you don't think that there will be some adversary trying to undermine your classifier by perturbing your inputs, you know, it still is a very useful way of trying to understand, you know, what makes your model tick and how to modify the kind of features that it tends to uh, rely on. Okay, so, so this is about the robustness as a framework. And the last thing I wanted to discuss in these lectures is something that kind of, we don't think too much currently, but I think we should 
think about like increasingly more, namely the data set uh, biases. And in some ways, like we kind of, okay, I will explain in a moment what I mean by this. So kind of, if you think of the way the current like, you know, supervised machine learning research pipeline looks like, kind of the picture is like this. So we have some data set, okay. And then, you know, we train some model on the data set. And then we evaluate this model on the test set and we look at the accuracy. And then, you know, probably we need to tweak something in the model because we are not happy with the accuracy. And then we test it again. And kind of, this is roughly, you know, the, you know, research and development uh, cycle for how the, you know, supervised ML is done currently, okay? And, you know, when we look at this pipeline, like what are the things that we are usually concerned about here? Well, you know, uh, the first thing is just this kind of classic overfitting, okay? So the worry is that, oh, you know, I am kind of training, uh, like I'm training my model on this training set. And, you know, I of course end up having, you know, good performance on this training set, but like, how can I ensure that this good performance transfers over to the test set, okay? So in particular, we are worried, okay, maybe the way, the, the reason why my model is doing so well on training set is that because it memorizes the answers. And, but it's not learning anything interestingly useful. And this is kind of what last 40 years of research in machine learning and machine learning theory was about, just trying to understand how can we ensure that this doesn't happen. And I would say that we are having you know, a lot of success in this context so far. The other thing that we, I think for a longer time, we were not uh, that worried about because even the first question was you know, already like, we still need to struggle with it, is this question of adaptive overheat, uh, overfitting. So essentially the question like, you know, because notice that like in this development framework, we kind of build the model, we train the model, we evaluate it. And then based on the result of this evaluation, we kind of refine the model further. And then we keep doing this. So in some ways you could argue that after the first iteration of the cycle, this test set you are testing on is no longer unseen because you're like, we have seen it in some way. Like essentially we got some feedback that depends on the specific you know, images that were in the test set. So this way kind of what could happen is that by kind of playing this, you know, playing this uh, cycle too many times, we might be actually really overfitting to our test set in this way, okay? And this is a broader kind of phenomenon in science when people kind of essentially like, you know, overfit to the data they have because they want to find some hypothesis that actually works, okay? And this is kind of the, the like how this phenomena manifests itself in the context of, you know, of, of the, of this pipeline, okay? So that's also like something that we need to be worried about and people are thinking about how to do it, how to do it properly. But like what I wanted to argue and bring your attention to is that there's actually one more concern that actually I don't think people think too much about. There are some people who think about it, but there is, it's not a mainstream concern. You know, well, this is changing, but it, it wasn't definitely recently. And the kind of realization that, you know, as much as we like to focus on this particular this whole research pipeline, there's one element of it that we are missing. Namely, the fact, like the part that we are missing is the fact that actually in the end, what we really want to do is just, we don't want to just do well on this test set uh, of this data set. What we really want to do is there is some real world task that we actually want to solve. Like we want to train a model that can solve like real world task, like object recognition in the wild. And this data set was, and this whole benchmark was just meant to be just a proxy for this real world task. And the question is, you know, you know, aren't we actually overfitting to the whole way how we try to project this real world task into a benchmark? Like in particular, is our data set a kind of, you know, a, well, it's clearly every data set will be a imperfect representation of the, you know, the, uh, the reality because kind of reality is way too complex to have any single data set capture it fully. But the question is like, are we not forgetting that this is exactly what's happening? And kind of in some ways, we may be focusing too much on making progress on this benchmark and the improvement that we are making actually might only pushing us further onto the benchmark, but not on the original task that we actually, you know, wanted to, uh, wanted to pursue. Okay, so this is kind of the question. So how do our data set actually reflect the real world? Okay, so you know, what data set biases do models pick up? Meaning, you know, what kind of uh, idiosyncrasies of the data sets kind of do models kind of latch on, even though those idiosyncrasies are just not completely connected to the real world task we want to solve? Okay, and you know, the question is of course like, you know, how are these biases introduced in the first place? Like why these idiosyncrasies in the, in, in the data set are showing up there to begin with? 
Okay, so just to illustrate a bit better, like what I mean by that, let's say a very simple study. So let's just think about like so-called background bias, essentially the ability of models to kind of depend in their decisions on the background of the object that they are supposed to classify. Okay, so normally when we see such an image, the task is to classify, you know, what is this? And you, you might think that, okay, if I want to know what is this, then I should only look at that. But, you know, kind of, you know, the question is, you know, to what extent the model also uses, you know, the information about the background that this object is against. Okay, so the first question is, you know, do this background actually contain signal? Like, is it actually helpful to look at the background? And the answer is yes, of course, you know, you can actually train your model solely on backgrounds, like just removing the objects, and you can actually still get a very good accuracy on the, well, both on the background version of the test set and on the actual original test set, like kind of like just so backgrounds are on, uh, alone are actually enough to infer quite a good accuracy on our data sets. And of course, this is not super surprising, like humans also depend on the, on the backgrounds, right? Like if you meet your work colleague, you know, on vacations, it takes you a bit longer to figure out who that person is, because again, the context is not right. Like we definitely leverage background and context to do this kind of visual reasoning ourselves. Okay, so that's not surprising. But what we wanted to do is that I wanted to kind of get a more fine grained understanding of like to what degree this background bias influences uh, model decisions. So we kind of created a, like a different version of the data set, like the one that is without background, any backgrounds whatsoever. It's against the random background, it's against adversarial background, and so on and so on. And in, in, well, one thing that we found, again, it's not super surprising, is that actually the moment you start messing with the backgrounds, uh, you know, uh, accuracy goes down. And this also is true if you even like take a background of an object from the same class and just swap them, okay? So it's not only that just like, if the background comes from a completely different context, it's detrimental. It's even if you take a background from the same class, you know, kind of you, the model already gets more confused. And in particular, like again, if you push it to the extreme, if you look at adversarial backgrounds, then essentially what happens is that you can fool a model on most inputs by just using a worst case background to kind of uh, uh, like to present the object against, okay? So in particular, it's actually even worse, not only that for every, sorry, not for every, for more than 85% of inputs, you can find a background that makes the model confused about what is in this in, the, in, the, in this image. Again, the object to, to be classified is actually always perfectly visible. There is no adversarial perturbations beyond change of the background, but it's actually, there are particular backgrounds that are very good at fooling a lot of inputs, okay? So my favorite one is over here the, in the top left. So this is a man, you know, holding holding something. Of course, we all know what, what, what originally he was holding, there was a fish, right? But there is no fish in sight over here. Still, no matter what you put, you know, uh, well, not no matter, but like for many of the objects you can put in front or, or like, on, or like on top of this background, the model still believes this is a fish, even though again, there is, well, beyond water, there is really not much that should be telling you fish. It just, all that the model is really like, like you know, uh, fooled, uh, fooled by is this kind of bias that essentially in the data set, you know, whenever there's a fish, there's someone holding it and kind of it learns that, okay, people present in the picture, you know, in such a pose means this is a fish because you know, that's what they learn from the data that they have seen, okay? And then you may ask, okay, so what would make the models more background robust, kind of less uh, susceptible to this kind of adversarial backgrounds. Well, clearly, if you actually train it on randomized background during training, then this does help because you know you are breaking any kind of connection between the background and the object to be classified. So the model says, okay, I should not pay attention to the background because it's useless. But of course, you know it comes at a price because you know again, background has useful information, and you know like and now you are the model cannot use it anymore. And also what we noticed that actually like it, this was interesting. So as we look at, you know, you know, over time, as we are developing better and better models for let's say ImageNet. So what, what's interesting about this model is that, that as they are getting better and better at the ImageNet, they also kind of end up relying on the backgrounds more, but they are back, more background robust. So in some ways, even though, you know, as the models want to be more and more accurate on ImageNet, they realize that they have to pay to the attention to the model more and more and more, but the way they pay this attention is kind of a smart one. Like it will, they will not be fooled by the background. Like in some ways, like they, the, the background is useful when it's useful, but it's not that they can completely rely on, you know, what the background is. Okay, so that's an interesting phenomenon that actually shows that like, despite this, you know, this bias, it seems that 
you know, so far our efforts to improve models actually go in the right direction. Actually, we are getting the desirable properties, even though we didn't explicitly try to uh, attain these properties. Okay, so this was just a simple example of a, you know, of a, a of a like bias in the data set that we kind of introduced. And, and now, you know, the question is, you know, but like, you know, beyond background, like it's very clear where the bias of the background comes in. In particular, like, you know, some of the amusing things about ImageNet is that like one of the natural habitats for crabs, according to ImageNet, is a plate, right? Because again, people take a lot of pictures of, you know, of a, of a, of a crab uh, on, the, on the plate, right? And of course, again, clearly that's not the world we actually live in, but if all that you have seen are the, you know, the photos that people put online, that would be the inference that you would make and our models learn that kind of inference. Okay, but you know, beyond that, like where, what are the other kind of sources of like this kind of data set bias coming from? And essentially like, it turns out that like, you know, there's a lot of subtle ways in which uh, these things can happen. So just to observe, like just to give you an example of what I mean by kind of, you know, biases in the data set that are more subtle. So what you have over here are just three images from the ImageNet data set. And here we have three classes, like you know, each of these is a valid class from the image. Okay. And if I show you this, like, you know, three images and the corresponding uh, classes, you would say, well, this looks like correctly classified, uh, correctly classified images, right? Unfortunately, that's not what the image and data set says. So actually the correct, you know, the correct labels for this, you know, for these images are here. And in some ways, well, you know, yes, you are wrong. You didn't get, you know, what ImageNet intended as an answer here, but like, can you really argue that, you know, this answer is worse than this answer or this answer is worse than this answer? So like what we have here is stage and there is also acoustic guitar. Like, why are you telling me that it is an acoustic guitar, but it's not a stage? And similarly here, honestly, like I'm not a, you know, a, 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 you know a, a, like a chemology expert, so, I actually don't know which one is correct. So yes, so probably this one is correct. But you know, uh, you know how how are we supposed to know that without extensive knowledge about like you know breeds of dogs and what are the subtle differences that kind of you know uh, allow us to differentiate between them? Okay. So kind of so 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 here's this problem that kind of there are these like ground truth labels in ImageNet that maybe are not as much of ground truth as you would like it to be. In particular. Uh, Again, if I ask you what is in this image, you probably would be more likely to, uh, to, uh, to answer stage and not acoustic guitar, but for some reason, the acoustic guitar was chosen as an answer. So now you can answer, okay, so where might be this coming from? Like, kind of, like, like, like why are there's a little bit misleading labels showing up here? And kind of the, you know, to understand where this is coming from, there's actually a systematic reason why this is coming, like where this is coming from. And to understand, you know, where this is coming from, you need to kind of, look a little bit into how these data sets were created, okay? So the way we usually think this kind of data sets are created, we just think, okay, someone took a lot of real world images from like Flickr, Facebook, whatever, like just like took all the images they could uh, get their hands on. And then they had an expert who kind of goes over each image and assigns, oh, this should be a class dog, you know, oh, this should be a class bird and so on and so on. Like that's kind of how we like to think about you know, how these data sets are created. Unfortunately, this is not how they are created because like this process is completely not scalable. Like we need data sets that have millions of images. Like you will not be able to pay enough experts to do this kind of, you know, careful analysis. And also like, even for an expert, like remember, ImageNet has 1000 classes. Figuring out for an image, what, which one out of 1000 classes is the most appropriate one for an image would be a daunting task by itself. And now multiply the times million images. Okay, so what do people actually do instead is something different and in some ways invert the process. So what they do, they actually don't start with images, they start with classes. It's actually a very clever idea. And they decide, okay, so what are the 1000 classes, let's say, that I want to have in my data set? Then what I go is I just say, oh, I use like essentially image search and I say, okay, so if I want to now get some images of class golden retriever, I just, you know, enter golden retriever into Flickr, you know, and maybe I look also like a different variation of this name. Maybe I enter it also in different languages, but I essentially like, this is how I get the images that I suspect are kind of images of golden retriever. But of course, I'm not sure, like there might be things like here, which clearly are 
kind of a dog, but not really, a definitely not a corner retriever. So I would like to have some additional validation. And that's where kind of the crowdsourced validation is. So how does the crowdsourced validation work? Essentially what we do is essentially we show them an image, okay, that we sourced. And then we say, that, ask, does this image contain an object of class golden retriever? Yes or no? Remember, this is a yes or no question. Uh, so that's easy. So it scales nicely because actually you can badge these questions and so on. So actually you can really just like, you know, kind of verify whether the label is correct with just a few yes, no queries, which are much simpler to answer than just like, you know, choosing the one class out of thousand. So that's good. But there's a big problem with that way of doing it. Because in some ways, you know, we, these questions are very leading because we only will ask, you know, does this image contain an object of class X for a single class X, whatever was the term that, you know, that we kind of use in the, in, you know, in the, like in the, in the image search. So essentially, like, and the person we ask, they're not even aware that there could be any other classes. They just know, well, is there a golden retriever in this picture? Yes or no. That's all that they are answering. This is a very leading question. Because, you know, now, uh, kind of, if you go back to, you know, uh, sorry, if you go back over here, well, if I get asked, you know, is there a acoustic guitar in this image, I, of course, will say yes. Even though if you ask me what is in this image, I would probably, you know, answer a stage. Okay, so kind of these leading questions are really a problem and similar is here, you know, if you ask me, you know, what is here and, uh, sorry, if you ask me, is this a church, I would say sure, you know, this looks like a church, but if you ask me what is here, then I, you know, I would say maybe monastery, maybe church, I don't know, right? Kind of you would have a bit more nuanced answer. Okay, but that's not what's happening. And so this could be a problem. Now the question is like how much of a problem this is. And of course, to answer that, well, you first need to get the right data. You actually need to get detailed annotations of what is in the image and you need to use humans from here. So ideally what you would like to do, you would like to kind of show a, an image to a human and you would like to ask them, okay, first of all, ask, you know, classify each object in this image. So allow for a possibility that there is more than one object in the image and kind of give me a classification for them. And also, you know, I don't only want to have like one class per image, like I just like, I would like to give me all the classes that you think are likely to actually be correct for the given object, right? And, you know, that's what you would like to do, but of course that's infeasible, infeasible at scale because that's exactly the reason why, you know, we had to resort to this different way of uh, annotating uh, to, uh, to begin with. But then kind of we realize there is a way of kind of, of trying to do something different. So what we do is we just want to, okay, so clearly asking people to name every object and assign it to one of the class, like one of the 1000 classes is too much. But maybe there is a way of narrowing down the set of classes that we ask the humans to consider. So, and what we do essentially, we just like take a bunch of image net models and we look at the top five predictions they have for images. And we only like kind of present the humans with some like, you know, this narrow down pool of, of you know, of uh, classes that are even plausible for this image according to our different models. Okay, so essentially like in the end, you know, what they get is kind of something like this. Uh, and, you know, and they can kind of, you know, maybe for this image, these are the only classes that, that seem plausible. And then we ask, okay, so, you know, essentially like, you know, like essentially we ask them like how many objects there is, which one do you think is the main object? and kind of what are the classes that are valid for this one, okay? Uh, so yeah, so in the end, kind of what we are able to get from this is this very detailed annotations when you say, okay, the main object is Battle Cup. There is actually two objects. And again, for the first object, this is the only class that we think fits. But for the second object, we have like these two classes that actually like, you know, either of them or like we get some, some like, you know, fraction of answers, but like we get some feeling that, okay, there's more than one class that could, that this object could correspond to. So this is actually like, yeah. What is EFT? EFT is a type of lizard. So essentially like this is also like, you know, this is also like a valid answer. Like again, this is exactly this kind of, you know, subtle thing that, get, uh, 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 that, get, that get missed. Okay. So essentially like this is actually kind of nice because you can view it as like bootstrapping the original image annotations and kind of we take another pass and we kind of clean them up further. So we kind of like just first, like you can view the image and annotations original ones as just the first pass. And now we kind of are trying to kind of, you know, bootstrap them to get even a better uh, labeling. And I think this would be a useful primitive for other, for, other, for other contexts as well. But now question is like, what did we find? Once we kind of had now this correct answer we could compare the image as label to this kind of annotations. So first of all, we find that there is 
a lot of multi-object multi images. So more than 20% of test images contain more than one object, which is something that again, Imgen does not take account, uh, like does not take into account. So this is an extreme example when there is like a, like a really like four different objects in the image. Okay, and there is only one that was chosen as okay, this is a microwave. Again, it's not clear that it should be microwave, not a stove, not a wash basin, not a refrigerator. Like, this is a very arbitrary decision that again, stems from the way the slave was generated. And the question is like, how does it affect accuracy? And you know, the long story short is that like saying that the moment you kind of like, if you look at the performance on the, you know, on the multi-object images, then essentially like, you know, kind of just insisting that the model answers the correct answer, I uh, mean, this, whatever it is, this image that label actually like drops the performance by at least 10%. So once you correct for the fact that there could be multiple objects in the image and you know what they are, and you ask me, as long as you get one of these objects right, you go to try it, you essentially recover, uh, you know, you essentially recover the kind of like this, this drop in performance disappears. Okay, so that's, that, that's one thing, but like, uh, you know, there's a more interesting question is saying again, if I look at the image, you know, like, and there is a multiple objects, like what is the one that the image net thinks is the main one? And again, it's very often, well, not very often, but like surprisingly often, quite different to what human annotators would view as, as the main uh, label for the image. So for over here, you know, the, uh, what annotators view as the main, you know, the main class here is military uniform, which makes sense. However, the ImageNet label is the pickle hardware, which is this particular helmet that this, uh, that this, you know, that this uh, uh, soldiers wear. And you know, similarly here, you know, we would say suit. The ImageNet says bow tie. You know, here we kind of say church. Here is the bell coat. You know, like like, like which, which is just this object, kind of. And the reason now it's confusing at first, but now you kind of realize that okay, there is a reason for that because again, if I Google bell coat, then probably this is an image that shows up. And then you ask humans, okay, is there a bell code in the image? Yeah, of course it is. Would it be the label I would actually answer if you ask me what is in this image? No, but you ask me just if there's a bell code here or not. And the same goes for bow tie and the for pickle hauber. Okay, so this is kind of shows that there are these kind of biases in this image net that kind of stem exactly from the way we do data, like we do uh, you know, label annotations. But what is actually more striking is that it's not only that this image that label kind of is not what the humans would view as the correct label. The more striking thing is that our models somehow figure out surprisingly often that what they should answer here is bow tie and not suit. Okay, so in some ways, our models, as we make force them to be more and more accurate on this data, they kind of reverse engineer this labeling process, like this idiosyncrasies of the labeling process of the image net and kind of they figured out that here I should not say church, I should say bell code. Okay, and this is clearly not uh, something desirable from our point of view, because again, like we, we would like the model probably to answer church here and not bell code. Okay, so, and then kind of, so, 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 so there's more issues like that, but like the point is that, that they exist. And now kind of, it also made us wonder, okay, so how good image models really are when we kind of account for all these issues with labeling? Okay, so in particular, what you do is you do human-based evaluation. So you say, I show you an image to the model, I get the label that the model produces and I don't compare it to the image at label. And what I do instead, I just ask humans, oh, you know, uh, is this, does this image contain the class that the model uh, output? Okay, so I just kind of verify the answer. I'm not trying to compare directly to the image and answer. And when you do that, is that essentially you realize that even with respect to this human-based evaluation, uh, the predictions of our models is consistently improving. So even despite these biases, I think we are still making progress. Uh, and, uh, and actually like what happens at this point is that at this point annotators, like if we present them either with the image net label or with the label open by a model, even if they are different, they can't tell difference. Right? Essentially like to them, uh, you know, both of them are equally correct. So this is actually important because it kind of might suggest that if our baseline for what we expect our image models to uh, achieve is this, like the performance of a non-expert human annotator, then we are kind of getting close to this, uh, like to, to this benchmark. And remember, we are still not at 100% accuracy for ImageNet. So the danger here is that like, if we start pushing further and further and further, we start forcing the model to just reverse engineer further how the kind of ImageNet was labeled with all this you know, strange quirks it has, it will no longer be about trying to solve 
a, like you know, like, you know, a human level object recognition. Okay, so the kind of this alignment might, might kind of be lost more and more. Okay, this is everything I wanted to, uh, to, to, to talk about in this, in this series of lectures. So let me just conclude. So, you know, we talk about this phenomenon of elevated examples and kind of, I guess one of, the, uh, one of the things to remember is that like, the reason why they arise is this existence of this non-robust features in the data. And again, these features do help in generalization a lot. And that's why our models like to rely on them. It's not that they don't like us, they want to spike us. They're just like, they find these non-robust features useful for the task that they are tasked with solving. Not the one that we intend them for solve, to solve, but the ones that we actually uh, like ask them to solve. In particular, this means that the interpretability needs to be addressed at the training time, because essentially if we don't align the way the model makes decisions with the way we make decisions, it will be very hard to understand why these models make decisions they do, why they make mistakes and how to debug them. And really like robustness becomes a way to induce more human aligned presentations. I don't think they will be like, they definitely are not human aligned fully, but they're just like more human aligned. So that's kind of a way of regularizing these representations to make them more resemble what we as humans use. And as we see, it just enable a broad range of vision applications in a simple way. And also like, you know, this, this kind of, this is a, you know, they support finding this kind of simple counterfactuals in quotes that I talked about earlier. And you know, in general, kind of what models do and do not learn is not always clear. Again, just the, the, just the fact that the model gets good accuracy or gets good accuracy on the image doesn't mean that it actually got all the concepts right the way we would like them to do. And you know, in particular, these models are affected by biases of the world and you know, and the ones introduced by the way we kind of prepare the data for our like and source our data for for, for our data sets. So. This is kind of the summary of the findings from the lectures. And you know, we talk about this like robustness perspective. And again, when you work on robustness, you really like your first instinct is just to think about these adversaries trying to undermine your prediction. But I really think that this is not about that. I think the robustness is really about really understanding how and what our models learn. Like kind of it forces us to really like confront this question. So you know, again, it, the question is like, what is the right notion of a generalization? Like, what does it really mean to generalize? Like clearly just the accuracy on the test set is not the right measure. It misses a lot of very important aspects of learning. You know, what features do you want our models to, to use? Because clearly like, it's not that any features are good. Like some features are better than the others from different, for different reasons. And you know, how, do, how much do we value this like human alignment interpretability? Like it's clear, it may be clear that you might need to lose something in performance to get things be human aligned and interpretable. Are we willing to pay this price? When are we willing to pay this price? You know, what is the process here? We, this is the question we actually need to consciously uh, confront. So in general, to me, this adversarial robustness is just a general framework, not just for making our model resistant to adversarial perturbations, but actually like a framework for feature engineering, kind of way of making our models kind of use features that we actually like and can work with. So I hope that that's the way you think about this framework as well. And yeah, I will stop now. I'm happy to stay just for a few minutes to answer some questions. And yeah, thank you very much. And then we'll have exercises today in half an hour. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, do you know of any work being done in the context of robust reinforcement learning, especially exploring phenomena qualitatively different from the supervised setting? So I know there is some work, like, you know, people try to study, well, definitely like, you know, much of the reinforcement work in the robotic setting involves vision. So clearly like anything that I said, uh, like relies to that. There are also this, this question, like, uh, like essentially there are attacks that, that show that like, you know, the, for Atari games that you can kind of, you know, show that like small changes to the, to the input of the model completely derail it. There is also, you know, uh, there are also works on, uh, at least I was talking to people, I'm not sure these are publications yet, but you know, it, it's that like kind of like trying to get robustness of the policies that you learn, kind of like imagine that you kind of get a bit of adversarial noise into like, and kind of to, uh, but like so definitely our work that just says, okay, my goal is like, imagine, you know, it will, it will imagine I want to do something in the, like in the robotic setting and imagine kind of that I want to design an object that not only like that necessarily fools my visual recognition uh, system, but actually, you know, makes me do a policy 
uh, like essentially like the internal policy transition that you know that uh, that normally you would not like uh, you, you would not like to make essentially like how to manipulate the policy transitions that the model does so so clearly like some of these things are kind of uh, you know are, are present there i wouldn't say that this is yet fully explored space but Uh, I have a question. So, is this uh, framework is this mostly theoretical, or is this is something that is used uh, in practice uh, uh, commonly? Well, well, again, so so it's this it depends what you mean by theoretical and, and in practice. So, like everything I've done, like we actually like there's a code you can download, and there's a library that we developed, like robustness library that essentially you know kind of implements all of this, and it works with real data. Like the elements are real. And uh, now, it, like, to it's hard for me to say how much it's used in practice because the companies are not that uh, kind of outgoing about you know about saying what they exactly do. But clearly, these problems are at the core of what makes deploying machine learning hard. So they definitely have a version of the solution. So again, so so you know, I know it is used in some contexts, but honestly, I don't know how broad it is. But definitely, like the question that we are talking about here, kind of come up. Like, think about just uploading images to Facebook. You know, Facebook wants to do some filtering of like if you do so, if you not you know upload something improper, right? Like so, there is a you know e like image of Hitler, you know, and they kind of like well, if you just do it straight, then it will get blocked. But what about if you flip it or if you add the visceral noise? And this is clearly that people actually, for whatever reasons, they try to do. So there has to be some infrastructure on the company side that kind of tries to prevent that. So there is clearly like you know, uh, I don't know how much they use uh, my and others' work, but like definitely they have to combat combat this and again if you think of spam like spam is a you know the old version of the same problem i'm saying you know i just am crafting you know emails and i want to have an email that kind of is spam but looks as much as a real message as possible and there is a constant battle over here so so in, that, in this terms this is a very real thing that kind of you know currently is going on in the, in the world okay i have another question uh did you try to somehow understand this non-robust features so i uh maybe mm -hmm. somehow try to visualize them it's not it's not trivial because like at the first um, glance you, you cannot see the difference but maybe there are some patterns and you can somehow identify these bits that that are really making this this change yeah so this is a great question and kind of something that i like we would like to do but we don't know how to do it like so this is the funny thing is that like we have experiments that prove that non-robust features exist we just don't know what they are. <laughs> like in a sense, we can't tell you exactly like yeah, what they are. It's, it's very unclear to us what is a good way to visualize them or kind of get a bit more hands-on understanding of them. So, so I don't know. Like I think this is an excellent question, an excellent direction. I would be very curious to see if someone has a good way. You know, like it's a little bit like you know catching a neutrino. It's like we knew that neutrino existed long before we could actually catch them. So this is a little bit like that. Like kind of like we know that these features are there, but we don't know. Like I cannot pinpoint what they are. For a given data set like what, what the model exactly is using using because you know it's very hard to scrutinize like you know how this neural networks really makes a decision like it just takes some pixels and does some math with it and then it comes up with a decision like what exactly is happening is very hard maybe it will never be possible for us to really understand what these features are but yeah if there is some progress to be made here that will be useful again there are synthetic examples of non-robust features that you can think of that kind of just to like kind of get intuitions you know just imagine that what i did is i took you know like i have you know uh, we discussed it with data poisoning it's like if i just went to a like you know a data set and just like every cut image like the top left pixel would be you know orange and every for every cut the top left pixel would be blue then you know this pixel would become a non-robust feature right because essentially it would be very predictive of what is the correct class but by just changing this one pixel you know, I can, you know, like, well, it doesn't make any difference to a human, but the model will be completely fooled by this. Okay, so this is just kind of an example of like what could be a non-robust features. I'm sure the actual non-robust features are much more subtle and kind of, and, uh, you know, uh, less intuitive than that. Okay, thank you very much for those great lectures. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 thank you. And again, uh, there are exercises that, uh, that Piotr and Maciej will, uh, will lead. And yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope you, you enjoy the lectures. Bye. <laughs>